Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Reasonable Doubt, brought to you by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. I, of course, am your host, Jimmy Ardwan. Glad to be with you another week alongside my co-host, Julio Vela. What's going on, my Davey? Every day, another day. Every day I'm hustling. <laughs> it's a good day, man. We're on the air. Um, poor Rockets. You know, oh, Jason, Jason Terry guaranteed that win. I'm glad it's over. Oh, exactly. hey. I agree. What were they saying? They were like, that anymore. it was almost like they said, um, oh, your opponent has left the game. Would you like to continue? So bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly uh, like, like that. Yeah, <laughs> it was like <laughs> that. The, with the arcade. Oh, God. It's been a good day, though. We had a, here in Houston, a, an appellate seminar with some great speakers. Uh, we had a great turnout today. Shout out to TCDLA and HSCLA and all the speakers and the people involved for putting it together. Shout out to them, and you know, we're here finishing the day off at a great show. We are, it's gonna be a great show. We got a lot of great topics to get to tonight. We're gonna to talk about Johnny Manziel. We're gonna talk about Dennis Haster. We're gonna talk about other couple, a uh, couple other local issues as well as some big national issues going on. And uh, it's kind of proper, I think. Um, but before we get to that, let me remind our viewers, we are gonna be taking your question and comments all night long. We'll have Twitter up and going, at HCCLA underscore TV. Uh, we'll also open the phone line, 713-807-1794. It's just Julio and I tonight, so give us a, a call or shoot us up some uh, questions and comments on Twitter. We'll take them right here. We gotta, we're going to have a, a lot of fun tonight, guys, because it is the NFL draft tonight. Uh, big big night, round one going. They've already had seven picks in, man, and two quarterbacks went number one. I, I was going to say, how many quarterbacks in the first round? So far, two. The one, one and two went. Uh, Goff and Wentz went one and two. The Where'd Rams they go? And the Eagles. Um, yeah, so we've got two quarterbacks off the board. They say like two more to go. First well, round. you know that's that's the over under is how many is going to go. Is it going to be three, four, or five? Um, could be as many as five. But you know, a couple years ago, look, Johnny Football went first round uh, to the Cleveland Browns, number I think it was twenty two overall, um, and he has proven to be a complete. An utter failure, not just as a player, um, but uh, he's really he's really failed to be a, uh, a I, I don't want to say role model because I don't think he ever was one. Uh, but he certainly whatever whatever chance he had of being one, I think is gone. Of course, the latest uh, issue uh, this week, a Dallas County grand jury indicted him on a misdemeanor charge of of assault, family violence, and. A lot of people are questioning why it's a misdemeanor charge. A lot of people have questioned uh, why it took so long. A lot of people have questioned why, if it went into Dallas, why did it go into Dallas County when a bulk of the assault seemed to have occur occurred in Fort Worth? And of course, Hulu, you and I talked about when we got that police report that was leaked from the Fort Worth Police Department. I mean, that, that was astounding in of itself, how much information we got, how long the report was, what was said in there. Um, a lot of questions, a lot of misinformation out there that I've been seeing on social media. So, uh, you know, first, I guess let's kind of start with the fact that it's a misdemeanor case and it was indicted by a grand jury. And, the, and, and a lot of people go, wait a second, why did a misdemeanor go to a grand jury instead of... It sounds being so fine? bad. It, it does. It sounds very bad. But when you read that police report that was issued by, by Fort Worth and leaked by whoever, I mean, it's not surprising that a grand jury was used in this case. But why? And that's the question I ask. Why was a grand jury used in this case? I well, mean, I think a couple reasons. Why? I mean, well, one, you don't have to use a, uh, 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 you don't have to use a grand jury solely for felony cases. A DA has the right in, in, a, in, a, in a case like this, and a lot of them use it in high profile cases where they don't want to be the one not to file the charge. That's exactly what I was getting at. And so, I mean. and so they'll use the grand jury to say that if, nobody, if nothing's returned, then they can say, what on us? We had, we had citizens review the facts in this case, and they made the decision that no charges were warranted. So uh, from that standpoint, given Manziel's celebrity status, uh, if you will, the fact that he's the Heisman Trophy winner from A&M, the fact that he's, you know, not now a former National Football League quarterback. Um, I think that's w one reason it could have been used. But the other is when you read that police report, there were some allegations 
that would amount to felony or could have amounted to felony charges. I mean, serious bodily injury. He's alleged to have shattered that woman's eardrum. Did, did she go deaf in one ear? I, I, I believe at least temporarily she did. Now, I don't know how you... I'm not a doctor, obviously, and we don't purport to be on this program, but when you shatter somebody's eardrum, uh, it probably makes hearing difficult at best. So why did... Still, so... Did the district attorney take to the grand jury and they just said, no, we're not going to in indict him on some sort of felony and issue what's called a true bill, which where the grand jury says, state of Texas, you should proceed on this case because we find probable cause. And then the DA reacted by uh, saying, well, okay, maybe not a, a true bill on a felony, but how about this misdemeanor? And well, and that's the thing. With a grand jury, you'll never know because it's a secret proceeding. So we're not going to know what exactly was presented before them and do, whether do or not they were asked to consider felony charges or if they were only asked to consider misdemeanor charges. Because if you remember, there was some police reports or reports about what the Dallas police were actually investigating. And, th and this goes back to how it got jurisdiction in Dallas. Uh, because if you recall, when the story first broke, it was all about Fort Worth, Fort Worth, Fort Worth, which would be Tarrant County. But apparently the fight began, the alleged fight, began at a hotel or outside hotel of the valet Zaza. stand. Yeah, the Hotel Zaza at the valet stand uh, at the Hotel Zaza, which is in the uptown portion of downtown, near, right outside downtown Dallas, uptown Dallas. And so that's how the district attorney, the Dallas County district attorney, got their hooks into this, so to speak, and had jurisdiction. But we don't know, other than the, the, the reports, the, the news reports that the Dallas County Police Department and the Fort Worth County, uh, the Tarrant County Police Department, or the Fort Worth Police, were looking at possible Class A misdemeanor charges. No one ever brought up felony. Do you think that this is Dallas and that's why nobody brought up felony? Big name, big, big lawyer in town, big sheriff. We're going to let the people decide and puts them in a good procedural posture to to fight the case or politically. Well, I like that. I think it's, you know, probably more of a political thing uh, more than anything. Um, and again, if they did ask them to consider felony charges, it would be a lot easier for them to say we presented everything. And, and also remember, too, you're dealing with a domestic violence situation. And of course, Julio, what are you, what is a prosecutor, who is their victim there? You have a victim, you have a person, uh, you know, who is, who's alleged to have been assaulted at that point. And so you're going to have to answer questions if you're a prosecutor to that person. And it's a lot easier, I think, for them to say, We've presented this, you know, and this is what came back. Is this the same night that uh, Johnny Menzel decided, like, to go missing and they were searching for him and they yes. the helicopter? That's, yeah, that's, that's the night? Yeah, that's the night. That's the night. Remember, we, we, we talked about yes, that. I think that yes, happened either yes. a day or two before we went on the air. Yeah. We talked about it, and then the next week is when that police report leaked. For, for, that, for that's wrong. Now, why do you, do you think it's because it's a high-profile case and politics are involved why it took so long? for Manziel to come in, or do you think he was just happy dancing out in Coachella somewhere? Yeah, right. <laughs> enjoying himself. <laughs> we got a picture of that. We got the Coachella I mean, picture. No Coachella picture. He is no Coachella he, picture. Look, from a, from a lawyer's standpoint, he's making all the worst possible choices you could make as a defendant, charged in a domestic violence case when he's already been, you know, kicked out of the lead for substance abuse. He clearly, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, go just Google Johnny Manziel Coachella. And, I mean, he's like, Ooh, you know, in, in, in a kitty, one of those plastic yes, kitty yes, ball yes, things. Yes, yes, yes. probably on what they, what are, they, what are these kids calling Molly these days? Yeah, I mean, I don't and, know. He's and this is around. like, he's the weekend before the grand yeah. jury's considering the indictments, he's doing this. And, and let's not even mention his poor choice in music taste. I think, but, do, do we have the Bieber picture? Let's get that up, because if we want to talk about poor choices... Uh, yeah, he's, the day he gets indicted, there he is. The, that's the day he's getting indicted. That's the day he's getting indicted. With the he Biebs. Is, he's with the Biebs at a Bieber concert. Now, um, this might be <laughs> the, the most offensive conduct at all, his choice of music, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, but. So, so, so let's get it. So, okay, so we got a warrant out for his arrest. A lot of times, individual. A lot of well, no, viewers, I don't think they have a warrant. I think it's I thought just, they. No, nope, I thought he's going to do it. a walkthrough of some he's, sort. Yeah, but I think they're just doing it as a you know 
a two beer or whatever. Well, uh, well, the judges set the bond. Oh, fair enough. So, I mean, think about it. He's he's doing whatever he's doing at Coachella. <laughs> <laughs> From, from, I mean, what, gets it. <laughs> from what I gather, the lawyer said, hey, look. And it's this not like they don't know where to find him. But from, from, He's on t- there, he there, is. Is, there, there is. There's the Coachella picture, headband uh, and all. De- listen to Dead Miles. I mean, now how would you feel, Julio, the, if that was your point. client? How would you feel if that was your client? I would say that it's unfairly prejudicial, and that's dumber than a bucket of hair. But how, okay, how does a guy like this get a fair trial? Um... I don't think he can. Yeah, I don't know. That's going to be I, tough. I really don't think that Johnny Manziel can get a fair trial because you want to talk about pretrial publicity, helicopters searching for him. Everybody knows who he is. Um, do we know what bond was set? $1,500. $1,500. Well, right. and in all fairness, maybe it should have been a pretrial bond. I mean, has he ever been in trouble before? High celebrity figure? Uh, yeah. Johnny? I don't know. Yeah, you don't remember all the stuff he got into in AM? Dude, seriously? Oh. You do not remember that? I just thought that was AM in general. No, but I'm like. Yeah. <laughs> I kid, I kid, I, I love that, AM. But, yeah, 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 right. <laughs> uh, but remember, he, like, as a freshman, before he got started, he had all sorts of legal problems. I think he got, he, he got at least a public intoxication charge, I know that, at a minimum. And I'm sh- I believe he may have gotten, and I don't want to misspeak on this, but I, I believe he may have gotten a little bit higher charge. I can't remember exactly, but I do know he had some legal problems, you know, it, early on in college. For the, for the viewers out there, the a PR bond is usually guaranteed or, or usually granted in the appropriate case to individuals who are not a flight risk and not dangerous to the community and such. It appears Johnny Manziel didn't get that, and his lawyer before turning himself in, said, judge, set the bond. And a lot of times you'll hear something called a walkthrough. I'm not sure if this is what Johnny was doing. But a walkthrough allows an individual, when they have a warrant out for their arrest, to post the bond and not have to go to jail or go to jail with just in and out, check in and check out. And I think there's some sort of arrangement somehow, because you're going to have to post the bond and be magistrated uh, at some point. So I think this is what the, his lawyer has worked out with him, called the in-and-out or walk-through, uh, most commonly known as. So what's the next step for Johnny? I mean, what's he looking at and what's, it, what, what's he looking well, at and what's the next step? I mean, isn't, he's going to have to make his court appearance, first court appearance, I believe, next week. So he's, Well, first off, he's going to have to, you know, obviously do his walk-through, post his bond, but then I think his court date is set for sometime next week. Uh, so he'll make his initial appearance, which in all likelihood, it's going to just be come in. There'll be a horde of cameras around <laughs> the Dallas County Courthouse. We should go. Uh, <laughs> we should go. Go with hey, our I'm a lawyer. Yeah, with the yeah. bar card and just oh, like, yeah. you know, be uh, up there. And... But, but it's going to be a non-event. It's just going to be they're going to reset it to another yeah. date and they'll come back later. Do you think, okay, you sitting on the on the bench, do you give yeah. Johnny? Uh, well, he's going to be a mo- He's going to have a... Uh, a magistrate's order for emergency protection, Absolutely. maybe? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, he's going to at least have a protective order uh, put in place against him, if, 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 unless she already filed one in civil court, but they'll put one on anyway in criminal court. And from what I understand, the lawyer said that he's going to enter a plea of not guilty. Well, yeah, but I mean, does he really have to do that? Well, let me ask you this. From what I understand, there is an out-of-court civil settlement regarding the injuries to... That would be inadmissible in criminal court. But a motive to testify? Bias? Well, are you talking about like Greg Hardy? I, I, from what I understand, they've settled out on this, well, this so the same, eardrum bashing. Well, thing. but the same thing happened. Remember Greg Hardy, who was, uh, played for the Carolina Panthers and then for the Dallas Cowboys last year. Remember with him, he actually went to trial on domestic violence charges and lost. He appealed it. They vacated the conviction on appeal. And then in the interim, before the retrial occurred, there was a civil settlement, and then the the ex ex girlfriend decided she wasn't going to testify after she got the settlement. Well, and 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 that would be up to the DAs whether or not to compel that individual to testify. Well, right, because I mean, it, just because a individual says I don't want to come testify, doesn't mean that it's automatic that the DA drops the case. I know if they I, legally have the right to still prosecute the case. R- the, and and right, but as the defense lawyer, can you imagine? 
just chomping at the bit at that. Oh, and sure. you received the, and maybe the settlement is pending uh, on the pendency of this case. I would love to cross-examine that at a, as a motive or bias to testify in their testimony, whether or not, uh, now if it's settled, I think it might be over with. How, however, uh, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If a defense lawyer were to inquire on the money that she's seeking or receiving from those injuries, then How's the prosecutor help? should be able to should be able to go into everything. If well, you yeah, exactly. Door. I mean, if you're a defense lawyer, you don't open up that door. That's right. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, yeah thinking about it, maybe not. Why, why would you go in that route? Maybe not. I wouldn't. I no, wouldn't. no, no way. I mean, no way. But look, how, I, I go back to Greg Hardy. Right. You know, this is this is yet another incident of a professional football player being accused. We saw Ray Rice, who he ain't getting back in the league. Mm. Greg Hardy. That's right. Um, we've had others in the past. I mean, this is yet another incident of an NFL player accused of domestic violence. How do you get um, – I mean, Hardy was convicted. He was – the conviction was vacated on appeal. But really, in all honesty, how do you get uh, a fair trial if you're Johnny Manziel in this day and age with Twitter and – just the perception of NFL players and domestic violence at this point. There's been so much coverage yeah. about NFL players yeah. and domestic violence. I don't know how he'd get a fair trial. And I can imagine, so who's the biggest, Brown's biggest rival, right? I mean, or... Well, he what, didn't even play for the Browns. Right, I mean, or anymore, but... Can you or is he going to be playing for anybody yeah. anytime yeah. soon? Well, can you imagine if going to a city where... Uh, the, the venue change is like they're you know some a Manziel hating city. Yeah, That'd Cincinnati. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> can you imagine that? No. I don't think you can get a fair trial, and and the dude needs to stop dancing around like a fairy and take and and well, go, going out. Well, and, and so that's the other question, Julio. I mean, clearly he has. If you read all the reports that are out there from uh, quoting his father his former teammates, everything about his substance abuse issues and the fact that they say he's going to end up dead. I mean, if he doesn't get help, he, his refusal to get treatment at this point, obviously, as a condition of his bond, he's not going to be able to drink, can't use drugs. I mean, if you're the judge in this case, do you, uh, put, do you court order more than just the random drug test? <clears throat> like, do you drug test him every week if you're this judge? If, if I'm elected, uh, I... I'd like to say yes, but I think they're not. Because at the end but of the day, But it's a legitimate though, question. When but, you know, that's the other thing, too. If you're just a normal uh, defendant who's not, whose name is not Janie, Johnny Manziel and you come into court, unless there is some other evidence that you have substance abuse, the court is not likely to do that. But in this right. case, I think it's pretty clear. That's true. There is, uh, you know, evidence out there. Right. That he has a substance abuse the issue. The pattern or history. Uh, ankle and monitor. And if you're the prosecutor, do you present that at the, at the hearing next week and ask that those conditions be, be put on him for bond? I'd imagine a prosecutor would. Um, you think they get it? You know, I'm kind of thinking like, I'm, I'm kind of thinking they don't. Here's why. It's Johnny Manziel. I don't think the system's fair. I don't think that they're going to give, I don't think they're going to treat the average Joe who we would expect it the same as they are going to treat Johnny Manziel. I don't think so, especially if Dallas needs a quarterback because, damn it, Tony Romo is not cutting it. Well, that's just because he gets injured all the time. <laughs> well, fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. Um, well, but... It's tough, yeah, I, man. I mean, I hear you. I mean, I just, I just think if you're, if you're a judge in that situation, why would you not order him, I mean, unless you're, unless the judge, and I don't know, unless the judge is a, a you know, Aggie and the prosecutor's an Aggie, uh, maybe they have a little sympathy. But you know what, I say that, in all honesty, a lot of people that I know who are graduated from a and they're, they're not happy about this. Right. I mean, they, they are, they're kind of, you know. Okay. That's so you, Manziel. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You well, know? Well, I mean, they really are. I, I said that back when he was an A&M. So. Right. <laughs> I mean, but so Johnny Menzel is looking at up to a $4,000 fine up to a year in jail. Right. As a misdemeanor. However. Practically speaking, he's not going to get that. Well, he, the thing that he has to worry about is that affirmative finding of family violence. Yeah. That The affirmative finding of family violence happens when you're accused of injuring uh, or assaulting an individual or a member of your household. Now, in Texas, that is a broad... Uh, definition 
cousin, girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, nephew, niece, uncle, roommate, anything like that. Once you get branded and accused with that, and if you plead guilty or cop to a deal, it usually involves an affirmative finding of family violence that will deny your rights to have any guns. It'll also brand you for the rest of your life as generally a woman beater in Johnny Manziel's case. Well, and to, and, and to go a little further, it, that affirmative finding can happen even if you get deferred. So uh, even if you get a deferred adjudication, which normally in, in a case, if you get deferred adjudication, of course, it's a form of probation where if you complete all the terms and conditions successfully, your case is going to get dismissed, and then after a waiting period, you can file a petition for non-disclosure and have the case sealed. However, in a domestic violence situation, if the judge makes that affirmative finding and attaches it to the judgment as part of your deferred adjudication, you're not going to get that case non-disclosed. That's going to be a bar to the non-disclosure, and it's also going to be used for enhancement purposes the next time around. Which will be a felony. That's right. Two to ten years in prison. And I can almost guarantee you his career would be over. He'd have to, a and would have to do what they're doing with Vince Young, bringing him back, you know, I, and working for like... I can't see that happening. Well, it's a pretty bad, you know, Vince Young just got charged with DWI. I, I did see that. The university kept him on. Yeah, you know, but, but there's no form of finding of family violence because right. those types of charges carry a special stink to them. It's not like a DWI. It's not well, like and a that's marijuana. what I'm saying is that there's been a lot of NFL players charged with DWI. That hasn't, you know, really obviously it's a problem, but it's not. It hasn't gotten near the publicity that the domestic violence situation has has gotten in the NFL. So I, you know. Depending on how this works out, Julio, I, I don't see a way that if he's now unemployable a la Ray Rice in the NFL, I don't see a way A&M brings him back as some sort of spokesman. I, I tend to agree with I, you. I mean, look, unless this, case, unless this case just gets outright dismissed where the complaining witness, uh, uh, Miss Crowley, I forget her first name, um, but I know her last name's Crowley, um, Unless she does do an affidavit of non-prosecution, says I'm not coming forward, and the state then abandons the case, you know, maybe then. But, maybe. but even then, you've still got the, the stink of this thing. Well, maybe this whole thing about sending the case to the grand jury, doing the hands-off, just kind of makes the case fade away. You think? Slowly. I, I don't think maybe, it will. Maybe. I don't know, How man. It's Dallas. But ev exactly my point. It's yeah. Dallas. Every camera is going to be at that courthouse. Ooh, it's Dallas. Know. It's Johnny Manziel. You know, it, it's you're going to have every TMZ is going to be there covering it. We, it's we might even be there covering it. Well, I'm not going to drive up there just to see. Well, I, I might I get a, I mean, that. If I can get a one-on-one -on -one with Man, Man Johnny Manziel, if you're listening, one-on-one, -on -one, reasonable doubt. <laughs> After your court, we'll just sit down. We'll talk about the case. Are you are you crazy? Are you are you on the same stuff that he's on in the in the Coachella? <laughs> I'm Julio, him seriously, I'm there's saying. no way. I'm just saying, his lawyer is going to let him sit down with the two of us. <laughs> well, I, I even think the lawyer was on the, the an article was. Any, we can't really say much about it, anyways. Any any lawyer with half a brain, not even a full brain, any lawyer with half a brain is not going to let him sit down for. Any kind of interview on this case. Is his whole family from the Dallas area? No. They're, I think they're from East Texas. There's some, if you're really interested in it, Julio, I believe there's some big ESPN, the magazine article that chronicles the entire Manziel family history. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Which wow. apparently yeah. is, is quite the sordid tale of uh, crooks, criminals, and, uh, you know, bootleggers. Johnny Football. So, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I, you know, I don't know, dude. I, I, this case, it is going to be, I think, for a misdemeanor assault case, it's going to be covered like it's, it's a murder case. Do you think the Dallas DA brings in uh, some big gun felony prosecutors to take care of this? Or are they going to let some three prosecutor in Dallas, over in Dallas, take care of this? Well, I, I, I would imagine that this case, um, and I, I haven't had a case in Dallas in so long, I can't remember if they have a similar to what we have here, where I'm sure they do because it's a big enough county, they have uh, you know, a, a dedicated family criminal law section, um, which you know, the 
FCLD. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that this case, because of its nature, would be a, if it was here, I think he'd be assigned to that division just by nature of the uh, of the personality he is. I don't think they would want. Um, I mean, that's my Im impression that sure. they would not just assign un unless there was a prosecutor already assigned to that court that the elected DA or the supervisors trusted to make the right decisions going forward and not, you know. Right. But you know this one's going to go up for approval. It, I know, so of course. Stuff. It has to be. It has anything to be. is done. It has to be, man. I mean, they're not going to let some prosecutor bumble all over this. No. They're no. not going to do that. No. You know, um, maybe the lawyer. That'd be great. The lawyer, I haven't heard of him, but apparently he's a, a, a real good lawyer. Up well, I think, if I remember right, and I, I, I saw somewhere, but I wasn't able to, to verify it, but I think um, he represented... Susan Hawk, the DA, with her issues before. When she decided to split? Yeah. Is she back? What happened with yeah, that? She's back. She's so she back, took the sabbatical think, and back? Right. Wow. Yeah, she's back doing her thing. But I think, you know, I think, um, I think his lawyer is the same lawyer who represented her. Dallas. Yeah. That's Dallas, man. That's straight detail. We'll, 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 we'll follow it. <laughs> and uh, I think it's going to be just a. I think it's going to be crazy. I'm looking forward to it. We'll see what happens. <laughs> um, the, other, the other big case this week, of course, is former uh, Speaker of the House, Dennis Hastert. Uh, he, of course, pled guilty and earlier uh, this year, perhaps into last year. He pled guilty in federal court up in Chicago, and there's uh, former Speaker Hastert right there. I love that we got him with Uncle money Bunny. in his yeah. hands to follow Johnny Football. Um, oh, because that's what this case was all about. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the case, he was indicted federally, uh, and it was he was indicted for lying to a federal agent and for structuring financial transactions. Uh, if you read social media and you read the news, uh, the headline says he gets 15 months for, uh, you know. Uh, child <laughs> pedophilia. pedophilia being a child molester that's not the case ladies and gentlemen he he was indicted for lying to a federal agent and structuring financial transactions now the factual background for to support why uh, the the allegations against him was that he was paying off uh some teenagers at least one teenager that we know of but apparently there were multiple teenagers that when he was a high school wrestling coach back in the 70s Hastert had uh, sexually assaulted, uh, had molested, and he had entered into an agreement to pay at least one of these, pay hush money to one of these individuals in the form of cash. Large cash. In the amount of $3.5 million. And what happens is he gets to about 1.7 and says, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to pay this anymore. Yeah. Um, and so that's when... As I understand everything, that's how the issue is then brought to the feds. Um, now, there's also, uh, that's what the reports are, but the, the fact is the way you get to some of these financial crimes is that the banks, through the Bank Secrecy Act, they have an obligation. When somebody is taking cash like this out, they have a duty to report it. Un, un, uh, under the rules, under the Bank Secrecy Act and the other financial uh, currency transaction reporting rules, they have the obligation to report suspicious activity, what they call SAR, suspicious activity reports. They have an obligation to, to relay those to, guess who? The FBI. And that's what they did in this case. So all that $1.7 million, the agent comes in and says, I'm looking Where over your bank go? statements here, and I see uh, 10000 out here, 10000 out there, 20000 out here. And so he looks at all this and confronted about it and says, uh, Mr. Hastert, are, are, you know, are you taking this money out because you're, you're taking it out of the bank and storing it for safekeeping Under somewhere Under your else? mattress? Yeah. Like the apocalypse is coming, like you know, <laughs> because he's he's worried as the oh, former speaker so of the fun. house of the economic so impending economic collapse, and he says, "Yeah." Now, and this is where the victim going to the FBI comes into play. So the FBI has the the suspicious activity reports, 
you get the victim who comes to the FBI and says, here's what really went on. And so when the FBI agent goes in and questions Hastert about this, he says, oh yeah, that's what I, I was just taking that money out and saving it. Boom, there's your line to a federal agent. That's that count. And then you get the structuring of financial uh, transactions. Now, he got 15 months in federal prison. And everybody, of course, is outraged that he would get 15 months for this. Uh, apparently, the government was trying to cap his exposure at six months. Six months for this whole thing. Um, politics. Well, it is. It, it, it's politics, but it also goes to show you, Julio, that when the, when the government wants to kind of, when the federal prosecutors want to, they can manipulate things. And this goes back to the sentencing guidelines, how they've taken the power away from the judiciary to really decide cases. And in some cases, that can be a very bad thing. In a case like this, however, uh, this this was a very good thing that, that for for the client. Not I'm I'm not saying it's a good thing because obviously the perception that's out there is he committed these awful acts and he only got 15 months for it. Now a lot of this stuff was because the statute of limitations for the child molestation charges had long since expired, and so the only thing they can go after him on is obviously the federal charges. But in this case, it worked to Hastert's benefit that his lawyer his lawyers were able to negotiate a very, very, very good deal for him. <clears throat> so this guy molests some other um, young kid, young male, yeah. uh, pays him about a million and a half over the course of 20, 30 years. And then once, do you think he knew that once, you know, that his exposure was limited, he decided to stop paying and if he had to swallow this pill he knew he'd probably get 15 10 20 months because keep in mind i mean i guess they could sue him civilly afterwards well no the statute of limitations would have run on that unless you still under some breach of contract theory well, well fair enough you know and so he's so he goes does 15 months that's about as much as he can do and he keeps the rest of his money to himself mm -hmm. and he can go retire and yeah, it's sick. It, it's hard to say why, but you know the irony of this thing is, of course, all this stuff. You know, he was one who he voted for a bill that would have eliminated statute of limitations on sexual abuse of children. You think there's a little Freudian, Freudian kind of like guilt going yeah, on there? I guess you know, but he here it is, and and, and uh, he is a guy who uh, you know the and and. I mean, the most amazing part is if you look at who wrote character letters for him. Who did? He was who, a Republican. Who? Um, I mean, you cool. had, you had. Um, I know that the managing partner of two prominent uh, law firms, Mayor Brown and. Uh, Mayor the, Brown's uh, a a big time uh, Chicago law firm. Well, it's a repeat donation to NPR. I hear them all the time. Yeah, and then the head of the CIA. Wow. The current head of the CIA wrote a character letter for him. And said, basically, I don't He's know. He's a good guy. I don't know this monster that he but, is. But, but, you know, the character letter from the managing partner at Mayor Brown was essentially, well, whatever the alleged conduct was, whatever the alleged conduct was. I, yeah. <laughs> read it. Whatever, yeah. Read it. It's, 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 and, and at this point, he's admitted to it because, and that's what's really crazy here to me, and, and I, I don't know exactly what went on at, at the sentencing hearing, but that judge was clearly angry. And I think it's disingenuous, and this is where his, his lawyers, although they negotiated probably a very, very good, what, what amounts to a very good deal, I would never have let character letters, a character letter like that go before a federal judge, whatever the alleged conduct is, because if you're gonna go before a federal judge, those character letters that you wrote, that you have people write on your client's behalf, I always tell people, you better tell those people that are writing character letters on your behalf, you tell them exactly what you did. Don't, don't leave any mystery because I don't want there to be something like that, whatever the alleged conduct right. is. No, because you signed a factual basis for the plea and you stipulated that certain things were true. And so if, you, if you're not willing to go tell the people who are writing character letters on your behalf that, then what good is the character letter? Because the character letter should be despite these facts, 
and despite it, what he has admitted to, okay? Whatever the alleged conduct be, isn't, it, it's not the way to start a character letter. For, for the viewers out there, that's a wonderful practice tip. When you're getting people to write your letters, first of all, don't get your mom, don't get your brother, don't handwrite it. So have somebody type it up who can talk to you objectively and that you have informed completely of the charge and let them relay how they feel about you after knowing about the situation you're in, convey that in a, in a proper letter. And it almost seems like, you know, that's almost good lawyering one-on-one. -on -one. You don't put a fluff letter in there, yeah. unless you got some other letters that are really good. No, you don't. I mean, that, and that's the thing. And, and, and we, we do it on the state side, too. It's not just federal court. Now, obviously, federal court, it is very, very important to have character letters because that can be the difference between a departure from the guidelines or not. But, but it's, they're still used on the state side, particularly in cases of pretrial diversion, right. uh, where you're trying to attempt to get pretrial diversion from the state, or if you are going to the judge for sentencing, it, where, where you can't reach an agreement with the state and you end up going to the judge. I mean, I've, had, I've done it. I mean, a lot of lawyers don't, but I think it's good practice. If you're going to have a sentencing hearing you know, in state court, you almost want to do what you do in federal court, which is write a sentencing memorandum explaining everything and send character letters. But don't send character letters that whatever the alleged conduct was. I mean, that was, that was horrible. Do you, um, do you think, okay, so did the judge do a departure from the guidelines or was he hamstrung by the guidelines? You said that you... No, I think what happened in this case was uh, based on the indictment, and I didn't... Um, the plea agreement I could not pull, so I didn't didn't get to see the actual plea agreements. Plea agreements are usually sealed, so you can't get a copy of those unless the court unseals them. My guess is that this judge sentenced him within the guideline range, okay, for whatever it was, for whatever this was. Now they did some manipulating of the numbers because the the quote loss amount for the structuring transaction. What was in the indictment was about nine hundred thousand dollars. Well, we know from the facts that he paid out a million seven, and we know he was intending to pay him three point five million. Where so uh, his sentence sh under the guidelines could have been a lot higher based on if they had gone because under federal law, the prosecutor could seek the intended loss, not the the actual loss. So. You know, they could seek the intended loss, although in structuring transactions, it makes it a little dicey because you're actually dealing with the structuring of financial transactions. You've at least got a million seven. So they cut him a break there by only indicting him on, on 900,000. Uh, so, I mean, I think his, his sentence should have been a little higher, honestly, which, which goes to some good lawyering. Let me ask you this, though. Does the victim play a little bit of part in such a weak sentencing? If, in other words, you know what, maybe you didn't take the one and a half million dollars, but maybe you said something right away. No, I don't think so. I don't think so on this. I mean, I think if anything, if this judge could have found a reason to give him more, he probably would have. I mean, it could have been that the 15 months was the top of the guideline range, too. I don't know where, where it right. came out after they did everything on the plea agreement. Um, the, the 15 months could have been the very top of the guideline range. I just, I just see this guy. I just, I, I, first of all, where in the world does the speaker get that much money to pay? I guess it's over time, but I mean, still, I mean, it's, it does, it does beg the question: Where does he have the? He was a high school wrestling coach. Uh, he what? He did work for a law firm, though. I mean, he he was, he was a lawyer at some point, uh, and and I, I, I believe uh, worked worked as a lawyer for a little while. But it does beg the question: uh, Where where did he have? the kind of wherewithal to get this kind of cash. How much time did that, um, the Penn State coach get? Did he get life or something? I will tell you. I mean, that, that, it's, it's kind of a similar scenario. This individual, you know, 20, 30 years ago is doing some really horrible things to some really young... Well, to be fair, though, Prince Sandusky was uh, doing it right up until very recent, though. It, was it, it wasn't, recent? Oh, it wasn't? Yeah. Oh, yeah. well. Yeah, okay. I mean... He, uh, it, w it was not something that, uh, let me see here. And Sandusky went down for a lot. I mean, I don't, I, yeah, I mean, it, it, I it, his life, last, double his, life. His last, um, it was sexual abuse from a for a 15 year period from 94 to 2009. That was Jerry Sandusky. Uh, he was found guilty on 45 of the 48 
uh, charges and sentenced to 30 to 60 years in prison. Um, that's interesting. So uh, some other states have what's called indeterminate sentencing for adults. So right. I think that might be something like a 30 to 60 years. In, in the state of Texas, we, we don't have that for adults. We have, you know what, if you're doing 30 years, you know, we have a formula that you'll be eligible for parole, but that you kind of know at 30 years, worst case scenario, you're done. In other states, like you have a 30 to 60 range and you could be released at any point between there. It's very similar to juveniles here in, here in Texas where we have indeterminate sentencing where, you know, if, you're, if your child gets sentenced to the uh, corrections divisions for juvenile, uh, I forget the name off the top of my head, but uh, it's an indeterminate sentencing and they can be held there for until they think that the individual's uh, been uh, rehabilitated or is fine uh, to and learned his lesson. Um, so we got Sand uh, going back to Sandusky. He did. No, you mean Hastert. Well, uh, on Sandusky, he did. How, how long did you say? Did, has he, he been sentenced? Well, he, he said got 30, six, to, 60 30 years. to 60 years. That's yeah. right. Um, versus the 15 months. Right. I mean, it's. It, I mean. Uh, yeah. I mean, look, when you take out the the financial, but it's like what they got Al Capone for. They got Al Capone for tax fraud. You know, they didn't get him for the murders and everything else. They didn't get him for the for the sexual molestation. They got him for structuring financial transactions and lying to a federal agent. They got him for covering it up. Um, Do you and think that, and those those charges, they don't carry as harsh a penalty, obviously. Do you think he's going to go to some super max or some medium no. security or? No, he'll go to a camp. He'll go to a federal prison camp. He's seventy four years old. Well, and, and, and look, you think they're going to put a 70, we've talked about on this program before, the aging prison population. So we're putting, look, we're going to put a 74-year-old in prison for 15 months. Like, I get it. I get it that he, he and, and I've said before, I don't like sexual abuse of children charges. No, nope. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't like them. I don't, right. uh, I hate those cases. You know, they're ugly cases. They just are. The reality is. Uh, as criminal defense lawyer, you're going to have to do them. They're ugly cases, but um, you know, I, I get it that that what he did 40 years ago was really, really bad, and he admitted it. He admitted and that he did it. That's the thing. The admission, right? The payments. I mean, it's very clear that he did that. Yeah, I know. It, it's bad, but do we really need to put him in prison? I don't know. Let's let's get a phone call. We got a phone call coming in. If you got another call, uh, if you got a question or comment, call in. 713-807-1794. Hello, thanks for calling Reasonable Doubt. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to if you guys remember the case uh, uh, about uh, Bernie Fine. He was Syracuse assistant basketball coach. Yes, yes, I remember that. That, that case was just recently as well. I, haven't, I don't know about it. What, what's the deal? Same, same, same situation. Uh, what with, kind of sentence did he get? Uh, I don't know. Let me let me find what, out real quick. Can you kind of fill it up, fill us fill me in, caller? What I'm I'm not familiar with the case. Well, they they said there was a statute of limitations or something like that, and he ended up moving moving to Israel and getting just getting out of the country. Just leaving. Yeah. Uh, Roman Polanski. What's it? Polanski style. You know that director. Yeah, Roman Polanski. Left, yeah, uh, like that. Wow. Oh, was it in Texas? No, it was up in uh, Syracuse, uh, New York. Yeah, it was. A, he was a former Syracuse. He never got charged. He ne they never charged him. Um, yeah. I'm looking at it here, uh, but I remember the case. Um, and statute of limitations would probably bar any prosecution, so the state never went after him. And then the f the feds in 2012 said they weren't going to go after him either. Um, and then in 2013, he said. He was going to file a defamation character lawsuit against ESPN. Good luck with that one, buddy. Uh, it, that one was dismissed actually just last month. Caller, March. let me ask you just from a public opinion, caller. You still there? Yeah. Do you think this whole there should be statute limitations on these types of cases, or do you uh, think? No, I, I think that these kids they suffer for a long time, and I think that's uh, that's not appropriate. You know, I don't know. I think in Texas, it's till they're eight, uh, ten years after they're eighteen or something. I, I don't do very many sex cases, so I don't know. So if there's a caller out there that a lawyer that knows out there, give us a shout. I think it's 
you know, 10 years after you turn 18 or 10 years from the date of outcry. Do you know, are you familiar with any of that? No, I'd have to research it. Really yeah, I, I, I don't know either. You're, but ask, you're asking me to do that. But do, thank yeah. Do you think that there should be statute limitations for things like murder or things, other, other types of charges, caller? No, no, murder uh, definitely should uh, last forever. And I think, in fact, I think murder does, yeah, unless there's murder. some sort of speedy trial type of violations where yeah, you can murder, attack. Murder has no statute of limitations. Right, that's exactly right. Um, so. Appreciate you call. Thanks for yeah. thanks for watching us. Um, no yeah, I you know we've got a lot of these cases going on. I just I don't know. It begs the question of whether it is the best use of resources to put a seventy four year old man in prison. I think that I think a better. I mean, okay. I mean, I understand I what he did. Is, I understand what he did is horrible. Okay. Yeah. What? But that's not what he was convicted of. No. Nope. Okay. And I, I think to some degree, the punishment, even the prosecutors asking for six months uh, and the judge sentencing him to 15 months, the punishment was based on conduct that he was not convicted of. But, there, but there's no what's doubt the justice, in my mind though, about but what's that. The, there has to be some justice. You can't just let the guy walk. I agree. That, I mean, that's the it, dilemma we have here, Julio. I mean, I mean yeah. I, that's what I'm searching for is where's... And look, I, like I said, I, uh, I've said it time and time again, I would be your worst juror on a sexual assault of a child case. And, you know, but, but I also struggle with, is that the best use of our resources to put him at 74 years old when he finally, when, when the, you know, it's kind of like putting, the, the, they've, con, they've found a couple of these, you know, war cr criminals from, from Germany on, on Auschwitz and everywhere else. They're 90 years old. Do, I mean, is that the best use? Of, and I understand. But what, justice must be done. There has to be something. I, I'm almost thinking like, and I don't know how, because I don't do much federal work. I don't even know if it's impossible. But if this, if they have some money, you take it. Because I agree. I, I mean, rather than putting the guy in, in a federal prison, spending money on him, maybe for a bit, uh, take every single dime that he has, maybe put it into a victim's compensation fund. Yeah. Maybe put it towards um, good causes regarding individuals who have suffered for this kind of thing. And I don't know if the federal government can do that. Well, I mean, he clearly has access to money to be paying people off. That's what I'm saying, if he so, gets money. But, but do we, as the taxpayers, you know, uh, he's going he's gonna to cost more than the average prisoner. I agree. I could, well, he's, I agree. I agree. Man, but... It's a tough one. It's a, uh, look, <laughs> that, that is, I, it's a tough one. It is yeah. a very, <laughs> that is a very, very tough question, but I think it's a legitimate issue. Well. A legitimate issue. I mean, uh, you know, because he, he's, he's being punished for something that he wasn't convicted of, in essence. Okay, so let, let's dovetail. So, we got another phone? We do have another call. Oh, let, uh, go you want to take the call? Yeah, let's take the call. Right, let's take the call. Hello, thanks for calling Reasonable Doubt. Yeah, this is... Um... HUCLA show, like the largest, uh, you got, what do you all say, the largest criminal defense bar association in the country. That's right. And it sounds to me like you're advocating for prosecution of more people. No. If you think, hang on, hold on. If you think that there needs to be some sort of quote-unquote justice done for 90-year-old former, you know, janitors in Auschwitz or even, you know, security guards in Auschwitz or 74-year-old speakers of the house who supposedly molested someone and then um, tweak financial things. Is there some other way of prosecuting, some other way to seek justice? Let me, let me rephrase that. Is there some other way to seek justice besides prosecution? Like we saw in South Africa. Now, I'm not going to try to get way out there, but in South Africa, they had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And is there some other way to seek justice besides prosecution? Well, and that and that's my point. I mean, I, I, I don't think, I mean, I'm not advocating that, that and thanks for the call, by the way, but I, I'm not advocating that more people be prosecuted. My, my point is he's being punished for something he wasn't convicted of. And so is this the appropriate punishment in this case, given what he was convicted of, given his age? D is it really the best use of resources? Well, let me, let, let's ask this. A, to answer the caller's uh, question. And I'm not sure that it is. Money. I think they need to take every dime that this guy makes. Yeah. I think that's the way it's that solved. But not everybody in this situation has money. No, they but, don't. But two, I think that 
justice, ha- the, the, yes, and there's not more prosecution, but justice has to be done. When there is, I'm a defense lawyer. I am a defense lawyer to the core. That is how I live, I eat, sleep, and breathe it. But I still think that there needs to be justice. Yeah, and justice can come in many forms. I mean, you, you know, justice, when, when people admit to doing wrong, you know, your, your role as a defense lawyer is to mitigate the damage. You know, it's not, you can't, and that's the thing about how do you define win and loss in this profession? Well, you can't win every case. You can't get an acquittal. You can't get a not guilty in every case. I mean, the reality is the facts are against you in a lot of these cases. Okay. So, you know, sometimes you're you're a card player. You're not a card dealer on this. Okay. You have to play it. Obviously you want to hold the state to their burden, but when you have a situation like this, where the client admits to what he did wrong, okay, and his lawyers did a good job mitigating the damage because it could have been far worse, but I wonder, and I, I, I feel like this is a situation where we could have done better um, because I don't think it's necessary to put a 74-year-old in prison. I don't think that it was, it's a situation where given what he was actually convicted of, that it necessarily war- warranted that long in prison. Now, I re- look, sentences higher than that are, are meted out every day in federal court for the exact same conduct, okay? But sometimes there's aggravating factors. Every case is different. So let, let me ask you this. Should the government be able to ask for something in return that they couldn't otherwise get in exchange for a reduced sentence or a better plea bargain. Like old Mr. Pedophile Dentist, who's, want, the government wants the iPhone password. Oh, yeah, 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 let's, let's talk. I mean, I mean that's, can that's they a, do that? He can't, he can't get a plea deal because of that. So and, set and, it up for him. I mean, what? Yeah. Well, so there is a, um, uh, you know, this is a, a he was a, what was it? He, he was dealing meth and kitty porn. Um, and he's, so he must have been a bad dentist. Yeah, and he's in <laughs> Manhattan. He's charged with distributing methamphetamine and child pornography. And a federal judge gave him two weeks to decide whether he's going to disclose to the government the password on his iPhone. Now, of course, we've talked about hacking the iPhone and getting in and everything else. But the, the, the judge in this case has basically given him a deadline that if he doesn't give that, the judge isn't going to approve a plea agreement in his case. And in federal court... Judges can, and same thing in state court. I mean, judge can reject a plea agreement, okay? But in, in in federal court, you can go to the court with a plea agreement, and the judge will say, "I'm not I'm not accepting that plea agreement. You can take your you can plead guilty, uh, but I am not accepting your plea agreement. Is that, I'll so, let you withdraw your guilty plea if you want, but you know, uh, and even then, they might not let you withdraw your guilty plea." Is that so long as the plea agreement's within the guidelines or within the range? Because I've always been told on the limited federal case that I've probably had about five on my own. Right. And all of them, it wasn't necessarily negotiating with the state on some sort of plea deal. It was, well, we're going to have to go. We're going to have to have a hearing and the judge yeah. will determine. The judge, but, the judge will determine whether or not you want to plead guilty. Okay. So is it and more then, like the, the, the government saying we're going to cap what we're going to ask for? Correct. Yeah. And in this case, the judge has said, if you want this plea agreement, you're going to have two weeks to hand over the the um, the password to your phone. So the only reason he might not want to hand out the password to his phone is because he's, he's going to get popped for a or whole more. lot more. <laughs> exactly. Right. I mean, because if you're going to save your butt, you're going to give your iPhone password. But it's like if you it, got some bad pictures on your phone. You're going to want to keep it secret because the government, I guess, up until a couple of weeks ago, couldn't get into your iPhone. Right, right. And, and so they have, the, in this case, they haven't offered him a plea agreement be, because of that fact. They haven't done it because they're trying to determine whether there's more criminal conduct. You know, he's trying to cut a plea agreement. He's basically coming in and saying, hey, look, you got me. I'm good. Let me, let me you know, plead guilty to all this stuff. But they're saying, no, we aren't going to do it. We're not going to give you a plea agreement until we know whether you've, you, you know, there's more criminal conduct out there. And, uh, you know, the judge is basically giving them a deadline, says you have two weeks to do this, or you got to decide whether you're going to trial or whether you're going to try and, and, and plead this case. What do you think? Should 
is that the same type of, is that coercive? Is that fair? What do you think? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's certainly coercive, no doubt about that. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know. Look, if I had to give a password up to save my ass, I'm giving my password out. But there's no guarantees it's going to save your ass. There isn't, and that's and I think that's what is the that thing. That, and that that's the struggle with again. This is this is the conundrum that that defense lawyer has, because he's sitting there going, "Geez, you know, I mean, it's I can." Gonna, it might be real bad. It might be there. Might be some really bad it stuff might be on some there. Really bad stuff. And I'm assuming he probably knows that already, because if he's if he's worth his salt as a defense lawyer, he's either probably examined it himself or at least. Asked his client, what the hell's on that phone? And why do they want into it so yeah. bad, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a... Uh... When was the last time you ever heard of a poor dentist? My brother's a dentist. Tons of money. <laughs> never seen a, I've never seen a poor dentist. I mean, I... Good, let's drop another call in here. Come on. Caller. Hello, thanks for calling Reasonable Doubt. Yeah, quick question. So uh, uh, we have a judge here who says, hand over the password or we don't, you know. Uh, oh, I'm just not going to accept this plea uh, deal. Uh, question is, what what happens? The guy has a cell phone, uh, destruction of evidence. He attempts to or actually destroys whatever other evidence he has on that phone, including, you know, digital files, what, whatever it could be uh, that could lead to other charges. Does the state they'll file him with? Yeah, they'll file charges court. on him for tampering with evidence. Um, Again, caller, I mean, you've heard it. I mean, social media is a bad, you know, it's very difficult for as a defense lawyer to say, take that Facebook post down or any other, you know, Facebook post, for example, that could be bad because it's a very fine line. You never really, you got to dance appropriately. And and I think you've hit the nail right on the head that if that defense lawyer says, you know, you know, maybe, def- you know, take that, delete those horrible photos. That could be problem. There could be problems. Yeah. Where, where my second question, your resp- uh, professional responsibility, what would you do? I mean, this is your client. You tell them to, you know, you can't tell them to go destroy evidence. I mean, obviously that's, you know, a big no-no. And a huge no-no. You, wanna, you don't want to expose your client to some additional charges. What advice do you give your client? That's the hard, the hard one in this case because I, it, it, it's hard for us to speculate because there's so many different factors that could be going on here. I mean, I'm sure this lawyer up in Manhattan probably has a relationship with the assistant United States attorney, and they, they're probably talking like, hey, if he just gives up the password, here's what conceptually we're willing to offer him. Or he's had experience with other cases, and he knows generally – kind of what he might get. And so Usually. it becomes very difficult. We're running out of time, Julio. Yeah, we're done. Well, I guess, <laughs> I mean, look, call, what's done, your name, but... caller? What's that? What's your name, caller? It's, it's Sam. Next week, give us a call. We'd love, I mean, give us a call. It's a great question. I'd love to finish awesome. up on it. Thanks. You bet. Yeah, we're running out of time, man. This, this hour flew by. We ate a bunch of it up talking about Manziel. Uh, yeah, well, it was very, I mean, it, I'm, I'm interested to see how it folds out. He uh, uh, apparently there's some sort of money that was settled, case closed. She's deaf in one ear, something like that. I don't know. I'm Let's looking. See. For, I'm see how it folds out. We're we're, we're going to have a great show next week, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to have the Democratic ca- candidate Jerome Moore coming on. Uh, for he's running for the uh, Harris County Sheriff for the Democrat side. Going to be challenging incumbent Ron Hickman. So we'll have him on next week for sure. May have somebody else on. We don't know. We'll find out. Uh, you can go to our Facebook page, find out all the details for next week. Also follow us on Twitter at HCCLA underscore TV. Thanks a bunch, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next week. Julio, good night.